bet you may saw the email. Uh, what? <laughs> I want you to remember this. If someone asks. celebrating the love of the Irish in October, and uh, I thank Maureen for being our model tonight with your uh, with your Irish shirt. <laughs> Man, I wish she had some enthusiasm. <laughs> well, like a lot of us, uh, Frank did grow up around here and um, is a transplant from New York. Uh, you'll hear that in the accent still. Um, arrived, I think, in, in Georgia around 2004, and uh, then opened McGuire's. 2008. But in, in kind of in the midst of all of that, was uh, involved in the corporate world of uh, logistics. And so I'm sure he'll tell you more about that. But we're thrilled that he agreed to come. I will just add something. Um, you all know I've uh, not been here. I'm, I'm one of the newbies. Um, so Sonoy, as we see it, is how I've always known it. I mean, that's the only Sonoy I've known. But in 2008, when this was a, a project coming up out of the ground, it was still a lot of vacant lots and even sort of tumbleweeds and um, you know so there was quite a renaissance that happened around that time and um, there's a, a little bit of a misconception that somehow the historical society is only interested in preserving the history um, we're also very interested in, in promoting our town we want our town to thrive and to grow and so we're so grateful that businesses like McGuire's are here and that when you think about just in such a small town, the restaurants that are represented here, um, we're very fortunate. So uh, uh, with that, I'd like to bring up Frank McGuire. Okay, thank you for that. Sure. Okay. Well, uh, like the introduction said, uh, my name is Frank McGuire. Um, you know, I'm the owner of McGuire's Family of Friends, also Crosstown Grill in Peachtree City. Yeah. And uh, a little bit of my background and, and uh, yes, yeah. Yeah. not all of it's going to come out in the presentation. Is uh, I grew up on Long Island, New York. Uh, played football at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, ended up coaching college football for four years after that, thinking that I was going to be a, a college football coach. Uh, that didn't work out, obviously. Uh, so then I ended up getting into the logistics business. And I did that for about 18 to 20 years. Um, worked my way up within a small freight forwarding operation, which eventually ended up becoming a six to seven billion dollar organization and being the VP of operations for them based in Amsterdam and Zurich. So that's kind of where my career took me. Um, and right in the middle of all that, we decided to open up McGuire's. Um, so, <coughs> Not getting too far ahead, but <clears throat> part of part of the reason why we opened up McGuire's is because I was a corporate employee, and yes, it was a family dream that we would all work together to open up a restaurant together someplace. Um, we grew up as entrepreneurs. I, my grandmother owned a steakhouse on Long Island, so I grew up as an entrepreneur working for a family that owned their own business. Um, my wife and I, Wendy, when we would live in different cities when I was coaching football, we would always be looking around for a business to open. We lived in. Worcester Mass, and we were like, oh, this is a great place for a bagel place, because we couldn't find good bagels anywhere. <laughs> so we're looking around trying to find a place to open a bagel shop. And then you start doing the business plan, you realize that you got to sell a lot of bagels to make money. So, you know, we, we're entrepreneurs at heart. Um, I always approached my corporate life as an entrepreneur. Um, and then when this opportunity came up, it kind of it fit within what I needed to do to prepare for the next phase of my life after corporate life, and then be able to do something with my family. So. Um, that's a picture of my brother, uh, Chris Fives. He's my, my stepbrother. He and I, um, probably maybe three or four months before the, the restaurant actually opened, uh, before the railing was there. So, all right, so let's get started. So, in the beginning, so I kind of led you up to, uh, I was a corporate guy, 
Um, I was a corporate guy, um, and we owned Coffee and Cones, which was a small ice cream and coffee shop mm -hmm. in the Wolfshire Pavilion, up right up here where Chick-fil-A is. Um, uh, Wendy opened it up, I think, in 2005, four-ish. Um, we had it for about three years, um, and while you know, that was a great launching for, uh, point for us for as an entrepreneur family, entrepreneurial family. Um, Wendy wanted to do it all on her own. She didn't want any, any advice from me on how to run a business. Um, that was and, a mistake. You know, I, 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 it kind of was, yeah. <laughs> you know, I come in, I'm like, you know how much this straw costs? And, you know, blank face. And, you know, how, why are you pricing your cup of coffee this way? Well, that's what Starbucks charges, you know, so that's not a good model. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, the coffee and cones piece, um, our entry as a family into being an entrepreneur, our children got exposed to it. Um, it exposed us to the, to the community, the Peachtree City community. Uh, we lived in High Grove at the time um, in Peachtree City on the Stars Mill side. So that kind of got us out in front of the community in addition to what we were doing as a family in front of the community, whether it was in sports or charitable um, projects. So there was a coffee shop in Wilshire Pavilion. And then so I'm sitting there doing my work as a corporate guy. It was a, I forget what day of week, it was, it was a Sunday, and I'm sitting there doing work in the back um, on my laptop, and Scott Figlar and Paul Lombardi, who is Scott's uncle, at the time they owned Riverwood Studios. Um, Paul actually owned Riverwood Studios, and Scott worked with Paul at the time. And um, so they were canvassing the area looking for small businesses who might want to venture down into Sonoya and open up a business knowing what they were doing from a, uh, um, a building perspective, which we'll talk a little, about, a little bit about. So they just kind of wandered into the coffee shop and they get to Wendy and they're like, hey, we're doing some stuff down in Sonoy, you know, did you ever think about moving your business there? And she's like, well, no, there's already a coffee shop down there. Why would I move a coffee shop to Sonoy? And they're like, well, we're looking for businesses and other people that might be interested in doing some things. We're looking for like a Cheers thing, an Irish pub, and my wife's like, go talk to that guy over in the corner down there. <laughs> um, and so Paul and Scott wandered over and introduced themselves to me and sat down at the table with me and it's like, hey, we want to tell you a story about what's going on down the road. Okay. So from that meeting, <clears throat> um, we actually got up from the table and um, walked down to Sonoya and walked, walked down a ladder. <laughs> there was a, a wooden ladder that came down here, and that's really where they did the pitch. They're like, hey, let me show you what's going on down here in Sonoya. <laughs> we climbed down this wooden ladder and start walking around this pit of, of what is today the building and talk about what's going on in town. So, So what was going on in town was So their first thing was is the whole film industry is, is tax incentives. They're already passed, right? But there need to be some modifications to those tax incentives that were on the desk of the governor at the time. This is going back 2006. So in 2005, those incentives were already signed, but they weren't, they weren't really what we wanted them to be as far as fully applicable to the movie industry, and that's what they were waiting on. So but those tax incentives were going to bring a whole host of business to Georgia, and at the time, Riverwood Studios was dead. They, were, they, were, they weren't doing anything. There was nothing going on in that studio. They had no projects. And so they were really seeing forward. Paul and Scott were looking forward five, ten years What's going to happen when these when the filming comes to Georgia? Is there are they going to have a place to go that's ready for them? Pinewood didn't exist at the time. Uh, there weren't. There was only two other studios I think at the time that were ready for business in Georgia, and so they were really trying to prime and sell Sonoy to the film industry um, to come and work with them in their studio and then also the city of Sonoy. So part of their vision was to make Sonoy a film back backstop for the film industry for various different types of projects. Um, so that was their first pitch to me was, is, hey, okay, yeah, there's this sleepy little town that doesn't look like there's much going on in it, but believe me, in three or four years, there'll be plenty going on in the town. So that was out there um, as you know, a big carrot for the city of Sonoy. Um, you know, the, like I said, the Riverwood Studios, and it's now Raleigh Studios, they've since have sold it to Raleigh um, and moved on into other projects. Um, they were really set up to benefit from those things. They, they were film ready. They had three studios, I think, at the time, plus a full-blown carpentry staff. Still, they, they could retain their carpentry staff and their design guys, even though they didn't have any work for them right now. Um, 
And then historic, co historic concepts and other local investors had already bought up a whole bunch of vacant property in, in the town. So they had already purchased the, the vacant land, um, like where the land that was between the Masonic Lodge, that vacant spot there, um, the plot that I'm on now, and the plot that's across the street from us that houses that other big building with you know all the other shops in it. Uh, those were vacant lots. They had bought those up, plus some other areas around town, which was the parking. They bought the lot behind us, um, you know, uh, to make the parking lot and all that kind of stuff. So all that was already done. So they already had made the investment in the property, and you know they dragged me up here and I met with Robert on Sunday. They called Robert and said, "Hey, we got one on the hook." <laughs> Robert Robert meets us down at the pit. Um, and so Robert was very, he was like, yes, we're, you know, we're business friendly, you know, and it's true, you know, I, this is the only place, I mean, I do business in Peachtree City, I can literally, you know, I, I get a call from City Hall that says, hey, Frank, it's time to pay your liquor fee, and I walk up and I pay my liquor license, you know, in Peachtree City, they don't make that phone call, you know, you don't pay it, they shut you down, you know, so here it's very business friendly, it's, hey, Frank, it's time to come up and do this, or hey, we need to do that, so you know, that small town business feel was, was very attractive, especially for a first time, first time ever building something on my own of this size. Um, so it was nice to have that, that small town feel and knowing that the mayor and the city council were 100% behind it. Yeah, they were a little divided on the alcohol sales and how that was going to work and the impact that an Irish pub was going to have on their small town and, you know, were they going to have people pouring out of my place drunk all the time. And, you know, we had to have some of those conversations about how that was going to be managed. Um, obviously, um, you know, also meeting with the with the police department and getting some of those things worked out. But they were 100 percent behind the growth plan of the town and what Scott and Paul were doing together um, with historic concepts, which was what their company was called at the time. Um, yep. And then so and then they were also able to show me plans of what they were envisioning. So Scott still has these plan books that were drawn up. They were really cool things you open up and it has a whole schematics. It's actually kind of interesting now. I'm sorry I don't have them. I, can, I, I tried to get a hold of Scott to get something to bring down here, but um, what they thought was going to happen with the gym property and the property behind the post office and what was going to happen to the post office and what was going to go into the piece of property on the other side of the railroad tracks, which is now the parking lot for where The Walking Dead is, that was supposed to be uh, an old whistle stop cafe kind of concept for the front to get the fried green tomatoes tours to come here instead of going where they were. You know, so there's a whole but there's a whole lot of things that were in the great idea list that didn't happen, and then there's a whole bunch that did, right? So, and some of that has to do with the economic fallout in 2008 um, of what actually came to fruition and what didn't. Um, you know, they had grand ideas of having a, a four or five star hotel, boutique hotel downtown. Well, that was to bring in the, the wedding business and also keep the stars from the movie industry from going to Atlanta because in their contracts they all have to have five star hotels. Right, so that's why they go to Atlanta. So they don't they don't stay around here, or they rent houses in, in Whitewater or in other places where people will rent them their houses. They were going to try and get a boutique hotel here to keep them here and spend their money here. Well, that didn't work out because the investment money wasn't there, or at least the investment money that we wanted we wasn't wasn't available. There's plenty of bad investment money. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so anyway, so there was lots of cool ideas that were out there that were floating around as other things, um, but for us. What, what really kind of, which I'll get into here is, so why, why is this a good idea to open up, you know, an Irish pub? At the time, the city of Savoy population was 2,600 people. Today, it's about 45 or 4,300 or something like that. It was going to have a $750,000 build-out cost. I was going to have to spend $600,000 a year in operating it in you know, open up a 5,000 square foot Irish pub in the basement of a building. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a great idea. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, that's, that was what I was confronted with when we first walked down here and took a look at that thing. And then, then you actually start building a business plan, a real business plan. <clears throat> While certainly the 2,600 people of the city of Sonoma were not going to support my operation all by themselves. And to this day, that's not the case. Um, the other things for sure came true. <laughs> <laughs> so just another, this is a view down Baggerly Way that, I, that was when we walked into that pit of what we saw, of what was going to be behind my restaurant. You know, so here I am, like I'm like, wait guys, is this what it's going to look like when I open up my restaurant and 
people are going to be coming up to eat at my restaurant. I'm like, <laughs> no, we promise you it'll be paved, there'll be bricks, it'll look pretty, we'll have plants, you know, we'll dress it up. So a year later, it looked a lot differently. But that's kind of, a, you know, the pig that we saw when I first came down here. So the business plan, you know, why yes? <clears throat> so why do we say yes? <clears throat> so first of all, um, our family um, and a personal desire to be in business, um, to have our own business. Like I said, I grew up in the restaurant business. Um, my grandmother was uh, restaurant uh, business woman of the year of Long Island, seven years out of like 20 years like that. So she was a very dynamic lady. Um, you know, our, whole, our family grew up in the business. And I really had a desire to do something together with my brother and my children and my wife and my dad. My dad made a year-long commitment to come down here from Long Island to help me start this up. It kind of worked out for him, too, because they had they owned the property that we had the restaurant out there. And their retirement strategy was to level the restaurant and put an office building on it, which mm -hmm. they did. And it's now leased out to a hospital for the next 40 years. Mm -hmm. So that's their retirement strategy. So he was kind of, I would say, bored, but at the time, he really didn't have anything to do. <laughs> so. Being bored and getting into the restaurant business isn't, you know. <laughs> so he came down here for about a year and, and dove in with us. So to do something like that together as a family, I thought was going to be really cool and really beneficial for my family. My kids were, at the time, I think 12 and, and 11 and 6, something like that. So they were pretty young still. Um, the relative cost of doing business versus Peachtree City or Noonan. Um, <coughs> you know, my rent rate was going to be fairly low in the you know, $16 to $17 a square foot, where in Peachtree City you're paying $25. Um, so those types of things are attractive. Um, certainly being the first restaurant to open up in Sonoya, um, you know, we were like a week before the Redneck, so you know, technically first time. <laughs> you know, but we, you know, I just signed my, my second 10-year lease with Scott. We have, you know, we agreed to run the same rent rate that I've had for the last five years, you know. So, you know, because they don't want me to go anywhere. We're having fun. We're doing. We're doing what we're supposed to be doing, supporting the town and supporting what we're doing as a business. And so, to live in the basement of this building, I get the benefit of having a pretty low cost of doing business. It's the benefit of living in the basement of somebody's building, I guess. <laughs> um, so, the relative cost of doing business was pretty pretty attractive when you when you start doing the business plan. And then the Peachtree City, Sharpsburg, and Fayetteville demographics, right? So, there's only th you know today there's 4,000 people in this town. But in Fayetteville, Peachtree City, and Noonan, you're over 100,000 people. Um, and the demographics are very favorable to family businesses. So that was the other thing we really liked about it. It, it wasn't something that lent itself towards being a bar. It was going to lean itself towards being a family business. 72% of my sales are from food sales, not from alcohol, right? So um, we wanted to hit the demographics of the families with children who are going to come and want to have a nice, cool experience in the basement of the building and be able to be family friendly and bring your kids, because that's that's where the money is, is in, in food. The big misconception about restaurants is that we make all our money on alcohol. Well, alcohol has great percentages, but a relative dollar figure as far as what you make is very low compared to food. You'll sell a steak at 50% cost, but you're making 10 or $11 on the steak. You pay your bills with cash, whereas you can sell the Bud Light for Four dollars, and it's got a 19% food cost, but you're only making two dollars and seventy-five cents. So I'd rather sell a lot of steaks at 50%, making ten or eleven dollars, versus selling a whole lot of Bud Light. Certainly, you got to put them together, you know, as far as a combination piece. But the point is, is that the demographics led itself that most of the 60 to 65% of the people fell within that 30 to 55 range with children, right, and ate out a couple times a week. Um, so that's what we liked, and. Um, you know, they didn't really mind driving three or four miles to go where they wanted to go, where they knew that what their kids were going to like and mom was going to like, right? So, um, you know, that kind of was part of the demographics of, of Peachtree City, Fayetteville, and uh, Sharpsburg. Noonan, we didn't include Noonan um, mainly because um, it was so far away, and they have to drive through a pretty dense area of businesses, restaurants, and other opportunities before they even come close to, to, to Sonoy. So, we really didn't include uh, Noonan in that. And even more interesting after that is that uh, about three years after we opened, we did this thing called Groupon, right? And the whole purpose of Groupon, you can get sucked into that, it can be a really bad thing. Um, we did it on purpose to see where our customers would be willing to travel from. So we did it very purposefully, and we only sent it to Noonan, we sent it to Deep Fayetteville, we sent it to Brooks and Woolsey, um, we sent it into Griffin. Right, we already knew Peachtree City would come here. We sent it to the other side of Peachtree City, on the other side of 54. So we're very zip code specific. <clears throat> and then we sent out the Groupon to that group of people. 
we sold like, I don't know, 4,000 Groupons or whatever in the first 30 minutes. It was crazy. We actually had to shut it off. But none of it came from Noonan, <laughs> which was the most interesting part about it, is that Noonan was the smallest piece of, of demographics that purchased what we thought was. So like, okay, well that proves my point that Noonan doesn't really impact me as a restaurant, and I would probably feel the same thing as Sonoya, as businesses, you're probably not getting a lot of your customers from deep Noonan. Um, and then even more so, because I did look at opening up a restaurant in Noonan, they contacted me probably three or four times, and when I would do the demographic studies of Noonan, there's old money Noonan, then there's the new money Noonan, and the old money Noonan stays right in Noonan. They don't travel anywhere. They go to the restaurants in Noonan, and that's where they stay and support those, those businesses. They don't travel outside of it. <clears throat> so I was like, okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. Anyway, um, so then also the pouring ordinances at the time, so pouring means on-premise uh, liquor sales, right? So my ability to pour beer, wine, and liquor inside of my four walls at the time in Sonoy, Georgia, were the most competitive in two counties. So what that meant was on Saturday, for the first four years I was open, I was the only place in two counties that could pour a beer after midnight. So all, 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 every restaurant and bar in those two counties on Saturdays by 11.30 had to make last call, had everything off the tables by, by midnight. Right. So what happened was, is once everybody figured out that we could pour after that, by about 10 o'clock, 10.30, their crowds would leave there or not even go there and come to us to hang out at wires from 10.30 to 2 o'clock in the morning. So that was a competitive advantage we had to everybody in two counties for about four years. We didn't know how long it was going to last. We knew eventually that, that they would change the ordinances and things like that would change, which it did happen. Uh, which is why we had this thing called the dance party. I don't know if anybody ever remembers a dance party or you haven't been around long enough um, or want to wipe it from your memory like I do. <laughs> but we literally would, at 10 o'clock on Saturday nights, we would clear out our entire dining room floor and move it into our cork room, which is our private room. And so you'd have a complete open dance floor. We'd put a DJ in the corner with you know flashing lights. And after 11 o'clock, our restaurant turned into a nightclub. We did that for three to four years. Mm -hmm. So, and in the beginning, it was great because um, one, it injected us with a bunch of cash that we, you know, as a new business, you know, we're still trying to get off the ground running, and we're still, you know, trying to do, you know, have cash flow, and it, it gave us an injection of cash flow for the first three years. And the money that we were getting was good money because it was coming from 30, 30 to 40 to 45 year old crowd that was buying top shelf liquor, and you know. You know, they're behaving themselves, they're all dancing, they're all having a good time, they're getting taxi rides home, they're, you know, had carpools, it was all very, very controlled, and everybody was having a good time, and they were spending a lot of money. Um, you know, I, I guess, you know, selfishly as, as a bar owner at that time, you know, the, the, guy, the guys who are clean cut and come look like they're, you know, have a job, and are spending top dollars, the babies follow that, right? <laughs> you know, it's just the di dynamics of owning that kind of an environment is, you know, the guys who, you know, they follow that, and then it's kind of this thing that snowballs on itself, and before you know it, we had, you know, the best looking crowd in probably two counties in the basement of my building for three years. It was pretty good. But then the ordinances changed, and everything changed dramatically, right? Because now those guys, they, they could stay out closer to their homes, and have their drink, their couple beers, they'd go to tavern and do their karaoke thing, or they'd stay in Noonan and go to their bars and stuff, and then they had a very short ride home. So then the demographics of that changed dramatically for us, and that was for us to shut down. So um, so that was the whole ordinance piece there. Um, so it was very friendly for us um, getting started. The city limit growth uh, was limited to locally owned businesses. I don't know if this is necessarily a firm rule, but it's definitely something that's part of what we we commit ourselves to is I know that Scott has a uh, commitment to leases and that he he does is that it's locally owned businesses right so there was no chance that a Chick-fil-A or a Waffle House or you know another corporately owned restaurant was going to move in right next door to me at least for the foreseeable future and set up shop right next to me and try to drive me out of business right so believe me there have been lots of corporate restaurants like the, the three dot um, the um, Irish bread pub guys they come in here and tried to, you know, solicit Scott to open up a piece of business in one of his facilities. He's like, no, I already have an Irish pub. So, you know, luckily he's been very supportive with that. And I, I don't know if it's hard written in the rules anywhere, but it was something that they committed to is keeping at least the city limits locally owned, at least 
not corporately owned uh, type of entities. <clears throat> and then the access to SBA loan money was very friendly at that point. It was 2006, right? So the banks were silly. They were giving money to anybody that you know had a heartbeat. Um, as long as you had a little bit of money on your mortgage and you, <laughs> you didn't mind putting it up, they gave you the money. So we were able to get you know a $450,000 SBA loan, um, you know, without really a lot of assets attached to it, which. And very quickly, a year and a half later, in 2008, was not the case anymore. So today, if I wanted to get that same amount of money, I'd have to be dollar for dollar capitalized to get it, which means I'm putting up a pretty significant uh, piece of uh, personal um, assets against that at risk case. And uh, I mean, obviously, this is this at the time in 2007. This was a big risk. I mean, it's a hole in Snowy, Georgia, <laughs> you know, that has 2,600 residents. And I'm going to be in the basement of the hole, you know. So here I am. I'm going to, you know, spend seven hundred fifty thousand dollars building this thing out. Um, and then Sonoy was already a destination town. Really, what hooked us hard was um, Scott invited us to see the um, the, the light up Sonoy parade and the tour of homes. So you know, we see we're kind of having some interaction in, in the fall. And then he's like, "Hey, come check this out." We come and we check it out, and the town explodes with all these people. Where all where all these people come from, you know? So. There was more people in downtown than there were city residents at the time. And there's this huge parade, and it's all cool. Everybody's throwing candy out there for the kids. And you know the whole thing, we're like, wow, this is pretty cool. It can only get better, right? So um, the car show at that time was three years old um, and growing. Um, and it's, it's huge today, and there's been lots of, it's been evolving, right, um, with how that's been going. And you had the Light Up Sonoy Parade, the tour of homes were already established, and the Memorial Day. So there's already reasons for people to come here on a periodic basis that you can build into your business plan and say, okay, I'm going to get hit with some cash here, you have some cash here. You had some things you can build on um, and why you would want to say yes. And then we said yes. Um, and we, we signed a 10-year lease with a five-year option, um, mainly because it, it, it was either going to commit to it or, I mean, it's like you need to do it or you don't. The five-year lease um, really didn't see to me that it was a commitment and Scott actually gave me a pretty good deal to sign 10 years. So, that's kind of why we did it. Cool. So there was a significant impact to Riverwood Studios and what they had. Remember I said they had a complete construction crew that was doing nothing. They were literally doing nothing. They had nothing going on. Um, and their design team um, was had no projects. So we were able to do mock-ups right in their studio of what the restaurant would look like <laughs> while they were building this thing. Oh, right? <laughs> so yeah, so that's Scott obviously. And then that's uh, Sarah. Sarah Palmer, who was my interior design lady at the time that helped me design the design the restaurant. So, um, but yeah, we got to do mock-ups uh, right there. So it gave us access to their entire, every booth that's currently in the restaurant today was built at Riverwood Studios. That, that's what they looked like before they stained them. Um, you know, we were able to see how big they need to be and how far we need to space them, how many can we fit in the space, all that kind of stuff. We did a mock-up of the bar. There, there was actually a miniature version of our bar at the studio. I don't know where it is today. I don't think it made it through whatever move they had. <laughs> so, um, but that impact, that was huge. Um, an example of why that was, um, if you take a look at the, the evolution of 